Okay, so <laughs> imagine you have a river and um, it's raining very hard and that river can jump its, its banks and it may flood into a big farm. And if that farm is just rows and rows of corn and it hasn't been uh, ditched out or you know, no swales have been dug, all that water can just run across that farm and rip out a lot of the crop and topsoil and whatnot. So if you were clever about it, you dig swales, you, you dig irrigation channels, and, uh, and you plan for that. So this is kind of how the economy uh, works, especially in suburbs and in a lot of uh, poor areas like in Kenya, but all across the world. Money comes in in the form of wages. <clears throat> Those wages go to workers who are basically exporting their labor from where they live, right? They're, they're usually working in some factory somewhere else you know, outside the suburb or the city or wherever it is. And then they're using that money to buy what other people are importing back from that city again, okay? So imports of cereals or whatever it is, uh, the, the, the worker is, is got his wages and um, is, uh, is spending them on um, imports. And they go back out of the, the community and there's very little local circulation. And what that does is like the, the flood irrigation. It kind of, it doesn't, the, the water doesn't have time to percolate into the soil. Instead, it rips with it a lot. It rips the culture, it rips out labor, it rips out the ability to nurture uh, communities. And so if that's what money could possibly do, it could be like the water for that community, how do we create that ecosystem where the water continues to circulate um, enough, at least, before it gets kind of pumped back out down the river? And so that's kind of what traditional development looks at. Traditional development looks at how do we uh, build industries in local communities and how do we connect those with supply chains and, um, uh, you know, build up enough jobs so that there's, they can afford better schools, so that they can have higher education, so that the workers can uh, have better jobs. And, you know, that, that this is sort of the, the model. Um, that model has worked in, in major cities across the world for the last you know, 100, 200 years of how to develop local centers of infrastructure and trade. Um, and it sort of stopped working at some point, right? Let's say in the last, you know, maybe since uh, the Great Depression, it kind of, it, it, the trajectory has slowed down. While the population has kept increasing, the, the, the spread of this sort of like trickle-down approach to economics has just kind of ebbed off and inequality has necessarily gotten more and more and more. There's so many more people, but the economic growth hasn't matched it, right? The, and the growth of the money supply itself hasn't matched the GDP of any country. It's something like seven times the rate. Um, so um, this is where local currencies come. So we have our, our story of, you know, the $3 bill, you know, the $3 bill that could have circulated 5 million times, right? Um, well, if that circulation was limited in scope of that $3 bill, that circulation, let's say it was just in Alabama, that would have increased the amount of trade in Alabama by a certain amount, right? Let's say it's a million dollars over the last 20 years, just this $3 has been moving around so much. Um, if there's any truth to that, uh, it means that there's an ability to create these ecosystems that nurture local development using money itself. Okay, So if you have money now as a tool for developing that, well, what does that look like? What are the characteristics of that money? Well, it would have to be somehow limited in its, in its circulation. And that limitation in circulation in the broader spectrum is what we call national currencies today. Right, so we say, well, look, the Swiss franc, it never joined, the Swiss never joined the euro. They wanted their local national currency of, you know, roughly 10 million, 11 million people to stay circulating in Switzerland. And it stayed circulating, it stayed nurturing that environment. And even there's, there's actually other local currencies around Switzerland doing similar jobs. Um, and so if that one characteristic of money, and we can have many, many types of money and many types of characteristics, I and mean, where we are right now, with money is sort of like where we were a hundred years ago with the Model T Ford. We have one version of money, just like back then we had one version of cars. If you ask people what is money, they think ah, it's this Model T car. But you know, hundred years from then, there's you know, 
thousands of types of automobiles and planes and all these kinds of, kinds of things. So um, right now, there's this exciting point where money is starting to blossom into a whole bunch of different concepts. We're getting rid of this uh, idea that there's just one kind of money. Um, and so if we're going to start becoming currency designers, and that's what this course is supposed to be about, it's not about necessarily you know, the particular designs that we're doing in Kenya, although that's going to be the, the main you know, practical uh, experience that you'll get out of this is just you know, what, what have we actually practically done, what worked, what didn't work. But in a broader spectrum, if we're designing money with blockchain, for instance, what, what are the functions of money that we really want to uh, pay attention to? And especially those that build community, for instance, that build local resilience, and that sort of decentralize um, the ability to make decisions uh, in a community. So in traditional development, you've, you've, uh, you go in and you dig your swales. You go in and you dig your, your irrigation channels. Um, so that smaller communities can bring in money from the river, right? They can bring in, you know, economic development. It can stay circulating there so that there's exchange and there's this, you know, this, the growth economically of a community with enough resources is this, you know, it's a beautiful blossoming of a forest, right? And there's so much life built off of everything that it becomes this kind of, you know, nice fractally, you know, pattern of jobs upon jobs upon jobs and, you know, Oh, oh, I sound like Trump. Um, but uh, it's, it's a very beautiful and good thing. And if that ecosystem can be strong enough, um, it can start to also develop its own unique abilities and its ability now to trade those unique abilities with other communities. And we have a you know, global ecosystem uh, of trade because of this. Um, you know. But uh, that's really hard to do. I mean, you know, why has that growth stopped over the last uh, few hundred years? Um, I would argue it's because of the limitations of the financial system. It's sort of like if you imagine, um, you know, the, the Roman Empire essentially stopped its ability to sort of grow because it was too centralized in its monetary issuance, right? They actually had to have these coins going out and being used as taxation to, to run the empire. And it was just, it was too much and there was too much other forces going on at the same time. You could say the same with colonialism around the, the age of, you know, British colonialism in Kenya, that its ability to manage these territories across the whole planet was was limited. And what what happened was that centralization of power and debt structures gave birth to this decentralized states across the world. And so, you know, the, the country of Kenya is a child of the decentralization of the British Empire. It's not necessarily a very happy child all the time. You know, it was the conglomeration of uh, 42 tribes that didn't like each other very much. There's a line on a map drawn by someone, but here we, here we are. Um, and so the same idea pertains to this idea of traditional development today. Where are we in our ability as a civilization to fully decentralize the, the issuance of credit and money and use that as a tool for this fractal growth that we need right now to survive as a species and to, you know, deal with these environmental issues across the planet. So, you know, money's not a panacea, but it's a, it's a, it's an important leverage tool, you know, and if we don't understand it, and if we don't understand how to design it, we're not going to be able to adequately use that extremely powerful tool to actually solve all these problems. And, uh, I think it was, uh, it was Einstein who said that, uh, you can't solve a problem using the tools that created the problem in the first place. And, um, and so throwing traditional money at problems, let's say the problems here in Kenya. So you've got, a, you've got a woman for five generations. She's been farming in the field over here. And she's going to be there for another five generations or more. Um, and she has no, she's never going to own a car. I mean, this is seven billion people on the planet right now. Are essentially living and there's another so there's 7.6 billion people or so so 7 billion right now are living in a situation where um, they're never gonna see their kids go to college they're never gonna own a car they're never gonna have uh, dental or any sort of health insurance right I mean it's a, it's a it's the norm on the planet right now 7 billion people living like that um, we need systems that can effectively give those people the range of humanity that the other 600 million experience, right? So 
there's this huge, beautiful range to what it means to be a human right now. We have humans in orbit on the space station right now. It's amazing. And yet, um, the vast majority of us here on the planet are living in a, like this range of humanity. Well, there's this other big range. You know, there's the range of being able to study what you want to study, being able to go around the globe and learn things. And, um, and there's, there's a huge amount we get to be able to do. So how do we design money to, to get there? Okay, so traditional development. We've got industries that come in and they go into regions and they try to develop more and more infrastructure that helps more and more local development to happen and it continues to grow jobs on jobs on jobs within uh, this local region. That doesn't seem to be working as well as it used to. And you know, you've got your few major cities across the planet where that's really entrenched and working very well. But when you go to a rural village in Kenya, you now have to begin to compete with all the other um, already entrenched industries around the entire world. Not, not just in your country, but all across the entire country. And that's very hard to do. And you get a volatile ecosystem anyways of uh, seasonality. And it's just, you know, to compete in that field becomes very, very hard. So what can you do as a local community? Um, what we are going to get very practical about in the next few lessons here is exactly how do you bootstrap these communities into creating that excess capacity and then allowing that excess capacity to begin to flow. So the basic idea here is that we want to look at loops within the community of trade that are there. So we do do or we work with uh, some industries and we identify what are <clears throat> the flows of currency within that community. Like we had the example of the three dollars going from the fisherman to the bait shop to the uh, ice store and back again. So how many of those flows exist? This in a way is, is measuring the tip of the iceberg of your excess capacity as a community. We're, we're looking at what's visible in the community right now and we're projecting underneath the water, you see the rest of the iceberg is all the excess capacity that is possible in that community. And essentially what we want to do is we want to create a credit, a means of exchange that is based on this future productive capacity of that community and also tied into local asset development. Um, so for instance, we want to create a credit that local industries, the, the, the service industry, the um, local production industries can use to employ local labor, right? Instead of exporting that local labor now, it's much more efficient uh, to employ the people you work around. We want those people getting their wages from this credit, these local currencies, then spending it on retail shops that are stocking also from more local industries, right? So we have the entire local loop. So we're saying, what are those local loops that are possible in that community? How do we create a credit or a currency that's based on those local loops that will enable them to continue to exist when the national currency systems are too volatile, okay? So we want to take traditional development and say it's missing one piece, and a very important piece, and that is building reserves within communities. And the reserve function, this surplus capacity of the community that needs to be there at all times in order for the ecosystem to keep flourishing is an incredibly important thing that is really missing in a huge amount of, of development work. Uh, there's people who go out, go around and build toilets in communities and build, you know, there's not many people building industries, but when they do happen, they tend to collapse, right? And that collapse quite often is linked to the fact that their supply chains and everything were too dependent on other volatile actors, right? Other people from other communities or other cities that the, the implementers, you know, this like a USAID, for instance, didn't have control over. They did their best, but there was a, you know, there, again, this community was a, a small little flea on an elephant's back and they don't have control over the elephant. And there wasn't a mechanism, there wasn't enough uh, a systematic way to create the resources in that community that could act as a buffer whenever that elephant jumps. Okay, so um, we are going to get into, you know, the, the practical bootstrapping, you know, how do you actually do this in the next few lessons, um, and I think uh, that's enough for right now.